I'm Justin. And I'm Jay. And together, we're Cryptids of the Corn Podcast. We are where scientific and magical thinking combine. We take my background in biology. And my background in exploring the unknown. We cover everything from sea serpents, UFOs, Bigfoots, the paranormal. Sky creatures, land creatures, cavern creatures. So please join us at Cryptids of the Corn Podcast. Community is always worth celebrating. The same goes for the businesses born within them. And with Drizzly, the number one app for alcohol delivery, you can find the biggest selection of beer, wine, and spirits that are black-owned and women-owned and more. Then get them delivered in under 60 minutes. Now you can sip with purpose and discover great drinks with stories worth celebrating. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com to start sipping with purpose. Just as I was unsnapping that leather strap on my holster, whatever this creature was, it let out a sound of a lot of lung capacity, big lungs, and an exhale with a huff in disgust. In this episode of Bigfoot Society, we talk to a Montana bow hunter who has an interesting encounter with a rather large creature in the Tobacco Root Mountains of Montana. What happens when the Bigfoot creature gets too close for comfort and the hunting party has to take matters into their own hands? Find out on this episode of Bigfoot Society. All right, Bigfoot Society, today I've got the privilege of talking to Leslie, who's an outdoors woman and bow hunter. Thanks for coming on the podcast today, Leslie. How's it going? It's going well. Thanks for having me. Now, Leslie, you've had a ton of really interesting experiences, and I'd love to get into those right away. So let's get right into it. Okay, great. Um, Well, thank you again. Um, I'll share a little bit about myself and um, how I was raised, which will help Um, the listeners kind of understand how I got to um, most recent encounters um, out in Montana. So I was uh, born and raised in the Midwest in a suburb of a city um, outside of St. Paul, Minnesota. And um, there's a trend in that area to go north for the weekend. So people, you know, do their work week and then they hop in their vehicles and they head north to Lake Country um, where there's woods and water. And I grew up in this way, and I hunted and fished with my dad growing up. And I've always had a love for the woods, and so that puts me out into the wild still today, um, where I go um, fishing and hunting um, and just uh, pick foraging for wild berries and mushrooms and things. I just really enjoy the outdoors. So um, my first potential encounter, and I did not lay eyes on what this was uh, occurred in 2000. Um, I was up in the Boundary Water Canoe area, which is in the northern part of the state of Minnesota. Um, And it's the boundary of Minnesota and Canada. And I was on a grouse hunting and fishing trip with my dad and several of his friends. Um, I often found myself surrounded by these guys growing up because they love to hunt and fish too. So, and that's um, who I spent my time with mostly. So we were up there and it was midday and I wanted to go grouse hunting. Um, And um, all the guys wanted to hang back at camp. And so I decided that I was going to just walk on foot and go to a trail. Um, And where we were was, if you look at Lake Superior and the west side of Lake Superior in Minnesota, and you go up Lake Superior, you find a town named Hovland, Minnesota. We were northwest of there, um, about 20 miles. And so I left camp on foot with my 12 gauge shotgun and I was gonna go look for grouse. And there was a hiking trail not far from where we camped um, that headed kind of northeast and away from camp. And so I thought, well, I'll just go walk that trail. And when you're hunting for grouse, you, if you don't have a dog to help flush birds, you just walk quietly and listen. And so at that time, I had no um, knowledge of, of Bigfoot activity. I hadn't 
really done any looking into Bigfoot behaviors or anything of that nature. It just wasn't anything I ever thought about. So I have my shotgun and I'm walking down this path and the terrain in this area is um, if you've watched the show Port Protection and you see that Port Protection gets a lot of rain and the ground is mossy and wet, it seems like it's always wet in Port Protection. That's a lot like how it is up in the Boundary Waters. There's a lot of rain. There's a lot of marshland. It's not mossy like it is in Port Protection, but it's just wet, muddy terrain. And you don't really want to go off trail. And so there was a hiking trail um, that was at least five miles long, if not longer. And I thought, well, I'll just hike down this trail real quiet and look and listen for grouse. And so without a dog, you just walk real slow, try not to make any noise. And you might take 20 or 30 steps and then you stop and you listen. And grouse are going to make a real quiet noise that sounds like water droplets. And, and so you stop and listen and you listen for the grouse to make noise. Um, And you watch for them, you know, down on the ground or you might look up in trees they might be perched there Uh, but that's what i was doing as i was just taking a hike by myself very slow and watching for grouse and i i was about probably a half mile down this trail and um kind of moderately dense forest around me and uh, the trail was mostly hard packed mud so my i wasn't making any noise when i was stepping and walking and stepping over rocks it's a very rocky terrain up there. And um, I would stop and listen. So at one point I stopped taking a step and listened and I heard a step off to the side of me. Um, And I forget since it was 2000, I forget it was left or right side of me, but I heard a step, a footfall after I stopped walking. And I thought immediately it's probably a grouse. And so I just turned all my attention in that direction and just listened and I heard nothing. And I stood there waiting for this grouse to move and nothing moved. And so I just continued taking a few steps and I thought, I wonder if that grouse is gonna move again. And so then I stopped walking again and I heard another footfall after I had stopped walking. And so again, I'm staring in this area and I cannot see what it is that's moving. And I think, well, that's, you know, it's a grouse I can't see. They're, they're pretty well camouflaged and I figured it was just off far enough where I couldn't see it. So. I continued to walk and stop, but then I heard a stick break on one time when I stopped walking. The next step and footfall, a stick broke. And so then I realized I was being flanked by something. And having grown up in the um, hunting and fishing, I've um, hunted white-tailed deer and I've had bear around me and wolves and coyotes and foxes. And um, I hadn't been elk hunting yet at that point in time in my life, but I've heard animals walking through the woods and um, this was not an animal uh, with four legs walking on the ground. It sounded like a you know footfall, you know, just like one foot setting down. So um, I didn't know what it was and I thought maybe it could have been a mountain lion, um, but then I wondered if I would hear the mountain lion or not. And so rather than continue on down the path, I just took my gun off safety and I held it kind of at the ready kind of my arms were folded and my 12 gauge was up, you know, kind of clutching it against my body. Um, so I wouldn't have to bring it up if I had to shoot in some direction. And I turned and I hustled out of there and I did stop once or twice on my way back down that trail back towards camp. And this creature was still pacing me and I couldn't see it. I never saw it. Um, so that was that incident. And I, I never saw the creature, but, um, I went back to camp and I shared with my dad what had happened. And he said, it was probably just a big cat following you, um, which I've never seen up there. It doesn't mean they don't exist. I'm sure they do mountain lions, Um, but I've never seen one in the wild. So that was the first incident. And I didn't think much of it after that. I kind of put it in the back of my mind and probably hoped I was never paced again um, out in the wild. But um, fast forward to last fall, Um, September 2022. I have a cousin, his name is Mike, and Mike lives in Montana. And he moved from uh, Minnesota out to Montana maybe 40 years ago. And he's an avid outdoorsman, probably one of the best big game hunters I'll ever know in my entire life. Just a real uh, smart um, hunter, 
uh, and really a good man, good family man. So has a great family. So um, having my cousin live out there, I've never gone big game hunting or hunting for elk with him. And I reached out and a couple years ago started traveling out to Montana to bow hunt elk with him. Uh, last year was my third year traveling out to bow hunt elk with him. And we were in a new location hunting. We were in the Tobacco Root Mountains. And there were three encounters there, which I'll talk about. So I'm going to set this up so you understand who was experiencing these encounters. Um, we had my cousin Mike, who's been an avid hunter his whole life. He's hunted every uh, large um, game animal you could hunt probably in uh, the U.S. or Canada. He's hunted a lot um, his whole life. So um, he's just a pro. So Mike was out there bow hunting. Um, a relative of his on his wife's side of the family, um, he was hunting with us and my son was along as well. So there was four of us and we had been hunting for several days and, um, the relative of, of Mike's wife, he had arched an elk and that elk was in the cooler or in the, you know, freezer and cooler for a couple of days. And then, um, or about a day and he was going to go out and do some scouting, look for fresh elk tracks because we hadn't been seeing elk uh, that week. Um, they weren't calling, they weren't moving. It was pretty quiet. So he had already got his elk. So he took off by himself one morning to go scout and look for fresh elk tracks and places we hadn't been yet in that area in the Tobacco Root Mountains. So he came back to camp after that scouting morning and said that he found a spot um, where one logging road ended and he parked his vehicle or his truck and he walked up this draw and found two wallows and wallows for the listeners who aren't familiar with that term that is a um, mud hole essentially that's created by elk using their antlers um, and the elk like to roll around in these mud holes to get mud on their hide on their fur and uh, they like to do it uh, once or twice a day typically and so there's all sorts of fresh elk sign around these wallows so we found two wallows um, and i'll describe the terrain we were in for this hunt um, so he came back from scouting and he, he marked the two wallows on his um, onyx app you know gps style app um, that we use for hunting and he shared the coordinates with me and um, the decision was made after he had scouted this and found the tracks and found the wallows so that was the best sign that we had seen all week for elk and so that was probably the best chance if we were by those wallows to get a chance to arch an elk. I, my son, uh, headed up to this area that evening to go sit and the plan was to hike up to the wallows and to pick the wallow that looked most active and have my son sit off to, if you were looking uphill, have him sit off to the left side of the wallow and I would sit off to the right side of the wallow at the same elevation. And with the thermals in the mountains, we expected the breeze to come down the mountain and carry our scent downhill towards where we parked. And so we expected all activity at the wallows. If anything was going to happen with elk, we expected it to come from up high um, to come down to the, to the wallows that afternoon. So um, we parked the truck and we hiked up this uh, drainage area and it's, a little bit marshy and mucky and um you know it's hardwoods and boulders and you know you're climbing up this area and we went uphill up this draw it took us about an hour and 15 minutes to get up to where these wallows were and uh, we got settled down uh, my son was on one side of the wallow i was on the other we're about 30 yards away from where the wallow was but we could see it and we we're just waiting and we had agreed my son and I had agreed we would sit until 7 p.m. and then we would meet back at the wallow and then head back down the draw to where the truck was parked on this dead end logging road. And so while we were sitting there, um, my son hasn't 
really looked into Sasquatch or even talking about it. Um, so, you know, he, he wasn't necessarily a believer or a knower or thinking that, that that was a possibility or anything, but we were sitting there and it was, uh, we had agreed to meet at the wallow. And if anything came up, although neither one of us were expert elk callers, very novice, um, probably sounded pretty sick making a call. <laughs> If anything came up, we would call to each other and then meet at the wallow. So we were sitting there. It was very quiet. There was no wind. I could hear nothing moving. You know, no animals, no pine squirrels, nothing. Um, and I heard a tree knock. And that tree knock was uphill from us, you know, a high, little higher elevation. But it was more over on the left side of the wallow where my son was sitting, but, but up the draw from him so further up and it didn't sound like it was too too much further up stay tuned for more bigfoot society we'll be right back after these messages and so um much like getting the attention of a, of a dog when the dog's ears go up and its head cocks to the side um, when that tree knock happened i immediately all of my energy focused on that area and i was just looking and trying to figure out what it was that I heard because it was the sound was like taking a Louisville slugger wooden bat and walking up to a telephone pole and hitting it as hard as you, you can. Um, just, you know, just real loud and distinct one big knock. And I'm trying to think of what that could be. And I'm trying not to let all my Sasquatch um, interest play a role here. And I thought, wow, that was a pretty loud knock. And I'm just sitting there and it's still just like super quiet. And I hear a second knock, uh, same exact location. And I thought that is a tree knock. And I got my um, cow bleat like reed out of my pocket. And I made a cow talk noise, uh, which wasn't great. And my son recognized that it was me calling to him. And he answered my call with his cow talk and he started getting his, he took his, you know, arrow out of his bow and put it in his quiver and was kind of getting ready to walk and meet me at the wallow. I looked at my phone at that point, which was in my pocket. I never thought in that moment to take my phone out of my pocket because when you're out hunting, especially bow hunting, you want to be as still as possible, as little movement as possible because the animals will pick up on it. And so the last thing you want to do is quickly reach for something if you think an animal is coming. So I just, I didn't get my phone out before this. Um, um, had I thought it was going to be a Bigfoot or possibly a Bigfoot, I, you know, you'd think, why wouldn't you just grab your phone and start recording at least the tree knocks or something? But that was the furthest thing from my mind. It was really um, fear and shock, I think I was kind of going into in that moment. So I cow talked to him, he cow talked back. He started getting his stuff packed up to move to meet me at the wallow, as did I. And I heard this creature, whatever it was, which was up the draw and maybe a little left of me, more in my son's direction. I heard it take some steps. You know, it was like three or four steps. If you looked up the draw, up the mountain, it went from left to right, and then it came down the draw on the right-hand side of me. And all I heard was three or four steps. And I heard it break a twig um, downhill from me, but off to my right hand side when it had started uphill for me on my left hand side. So three or four footfalls, it covered 75 yards or more, a hundred yards. It just, it covered so much ground in those step, step, step when it snapped a twig. Uh, I don't know what could cover that much ground in those few steps, unless I didn't hear the steps in between those and they were shorter, or if there was more than one creature around me, but the directions of the steps were that way from upper left. And then it went across above me in elevation and then came down to my right hand side it was heading down the draw in the direction of where my truck was parked. So I meet my son at the wallow. He walks up to it. I walk up to it. And he said, what, what was that? And I said, what did you hear? And we talked about it. And I said, let's get off the mountain. Um, and when I had grabbed my phone and looked at it after I cow talked to him, it was 10 minutes to seven. And we had agreed to meet at seven o'clock at the wallow, but I couldn't wait. I had to get out of there in that moment 
Um, and I had to get, I was worried that these knocks were over by him. Um, and he only had a nine millimeter that he was carrying and I was carrying a 10. Um, and so I at least wanted to get us together. So we at least had those two handguns, you know, together versus just his alone, should something happen that was, you know, requiring us to pull our guns. So, um, I said, let's get out of here. It took us an hour and 15 minutes to get up. It took us about 20 minutes to get down. Uh, we semi ran down <laughs> the draw to get to the truck. So we're moving pretty quick. Um, we went back to camp. Uh, my cousin and, uh, the relative from his wife's side were there at camp. They didn't go out hunting that afternoon. They were processing the elk that, um, this other, the other person with us harvested, you know, the day before. So they were in camp processing. Uh, there were no, no other hunters around. There were no other vehicles around, um, really kind of out there by ourselves. Um, so we go back to camp and I share with them what happened, um, and what we heard with the knocking and the walking and the gentleman with us that had harvested the elk, he said, Oh, the same thing happened to me this morning. So he experienced exactly, or what I thought was exactly what my son and I had experienced that morning. Um, but he gave us the coordinates to go back up there that evening to sit uh, for the hunt. Um, and so we went up there not knowing that that had happened to him. But I described where this creature walked and its footfalls and how far it got. And he said exactly the same thing in terms of the knocks and the where they came from and the walking away. So I thought that was... Uh, too much of a coincidence to to not cause alarm for me and so sitting around that evening we decided that uh the next day the four of us were going to go hunt that area because that's where the elk tracks were and we really wanted to harvest another elk um, and so that particular area in the tobacco root mountains the the road that i had parked on the night before and walked up that was a lower logging road there was a logging road above this area as well so you could drive the upper logging road and park and then walk down this draw. So the next morning, my son and this other gentleman drove on the upper logging road and parked. And the plan was for them to come down the draw. I'm going to say it's east, east of the wallows. That's where they came down the draw. And they stopped at the same elevation as the wallows. And uh, my cousin Mike and I parked at the lower area where my son and I parked the night before and went up the draw. And we went up to where the wallow was that my son and I were hunting on at the same elevation the other two guys were at. And together at that time, they were um, bugling and cow talking back and forth. Um, we were as two separate groups to try and get some elk moving in the area um, to see if we could create some excitement for elk so that we could maybe see one so this other gentleman would would bugle or cow talk and then my cousin who's an expert caller he would do the same back or a similar call or answer so we did this for a little while until my cousin and i were standing by the wallow and doing this cow talk and bugling and just having having periods of quiet time you know 10 minutes of just standing there listening and then there would be more talking, you know, uh, cow talking or whatever. Uh, we were hunting, basically. Um, there was a tree knock in the same spot it happened the night before. And the same spot that happened to the other gentleman the morning before. And I just looked at at Mike and I, he said, was that a tree knock? He looked at me and I just uh, uh, shook my head yes or said yes or something real quiet. Um, because the woods were so quiet. And so he reaches down and he grabs a stick that he finds and, and it was uh, thicker than a baseball bat, uh, but he found a stick and he just uh, held one finger up to me, like, hang on a second. And he whacked that stick on the tree to knock back. And when he did that, his stick broke into many pieces. It was like a rotten branch or something, but it was a knock. And he dropped that piece that was still in his hand and we stood there and this thing knocked back so it responded to his knock 
And again, this thing is so close to us, we couldn't see it, but it was like knocking what would be probably if you're in thick woods, imagine 20 yards away or 30 yards away, that's 20 large steps or 30 large steps away is where this knock came back from. And it just felt like it was just so close to us. And I looked at him and um, probably used some colorful language and said, let's get out of here. And unbeknownst to me, he was, he was angled away from me and he carried his big bear gun on his right hip, kind of in his rib cage area. And uh, my gun is a chest holster gun with a leather strap that goes over it to hold it in the holster. And uh, I didn't know this, but he unholstered his gun and he, that side of his body was facing away from me. That side of his body was facing the direction of where this tree knocking was coming from. So he unholsters his gun and, and looks at me and he makes a motion with his hand for me to unsnap the leather strap that straps my 10 millimeter into its holster on my chest. And so when he told me to, to do that and get ready, um, like uh, I maybe I went ashen or, or all white or something. I was just so, it was pretty scary. Um, so I knew a, a guy who spent his life hunting in the mountains for large game, for him to unholster his gun because he feels a threat, that's pretty serious in, in my book. So, um, and I have a lot of respect for his hunting knowledge and and everything. So when he's telling me to get ready, um, I, un I unsnapped that leather strap and I grabbed on, you know, to, to my gun. I didn't unholster it, but I was ready to, um, if I needed to. Um, so I had my bow in one hand and my other hand up on my handle of my gun. And, um, just as I was unsnapping that leather strap on my holster, whatever this creature was, it let out a sound that, um, I've heard somebody describe in another podcast recently, um, actually Mike called my attention to it, my cousin, um, but it was a sound of um, a lot of air leaving a lot of lung capacity, you know, big lungs, and an exhale with a huff in disgust. So if you can imagine just the most disgusted, loud huff, um, that if I could assign an emotion to it, I would say disgust. And it was probably about the same time that Mike was unholstering his gun. He unholstered his gun, looked at me and, and gave me the motion to unsnap that leather strap, which I did. And this thing huffed and he turned to face the direction of where this thing was huffing from. And it then walked in the same direction it had walked for my son and I the night before in the same direction it walked for the other gentleman the morning before and it went down the hill and again it was just a few steps and it was out of there um, so i said we needed to get out of there and he agreed and we walked in the direction of where the other two guys were same elevation we headed i'm going to say to the east or to the right and walked over to them and they had heard the tree knocks and they heard the walking because it had walked down the draw between where we were and where they were um, and so we walked over there and we were kind of debriefing on what was going on. And that's when the other gentleman who had already harvested his elk, who was, who was there um, calling and looking for deer while we were looking for elk, he had said that when he had his encounter 24 hours earlier, that he had unholstered his gun and that this creature did that huff at him as well in disgust. And he said, the way that you described it, it's exactly how it happened to me. And so I'm thinking, wait a minute, you, you had all this information that you didn't share with us. And then you sent us into this area where all these things happen. As it turned out, he unholstered his gun and he ran down the mountain to get out of there. I don't know if he ran, but he got out of there quick um, because he said that he was, it scared him, whatever it was. It was, he didn't know what it was. Um, so having been, um, having grown up in the woods and hunting and listening to animals move. Um, I just can't figure out what would have single footfalls and what would make that noise and do the knocks and knock back. And everything keeps coming back to, to Sasquatch for me. Um, but I didn't lay eyes on it. Um, I did contact a um, game warden 
uh, about a month after this happened or more to report it uh, or several weeks later to report the incident and provide the coordinates. And uh, that particular game warden said they lived five miles from that location and would definitely go check it out. So I suggested he, that he didn't go alone. He would bring someone with because this was, I didn't see any tracks, but it just sounded like a big animal. It covered a lot of ground pretty quickly. So that is um, basically the, the first encounter of whether it was an encounter or not, the pacing in 2000, and then these three three accounts in the same exact area and the behavior that we encountered. Can I ask a few questions uh, before? Absolutely. Okay, so that that's absolutely incredible. Um, so your cousin Mike is a big game hunter. Uh, I'm sure he's very familiar with the animals in that area. Um, are there any other animals that could make a huff sound uh, like that? It sounded like he was... I mean, he he was ready with his gun for something. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot Society. We'll be right back after these messages. He absolutely was ready with his gun. I didn't know that he unholstered his gun. Um, when he told me to get ready, you know, when he gave me that hand motion to unsnap the leather strap that was holding my gun in, that is when I realized he had unholstered his gun. And that is about the time when this creature did that disgusted huff. And that's when he then turned to face that direction. And we were both just looking as hard as we could to try and see what, what this was. And then it walked off and we couldn't see it. We could hear it walk off and we never saw it. It was, but he is a, he is a very avid hunter. He's been hunting his whole life. He's been hunting those mountains his whole life. Um, but he didn't, he couldn't figure out what it is. I know it, it bothers him like it bothers me today thinking about it in terms of we just, uh, neither one of us really want to see it or wanted to see it or have the encounter, but to see it then would have put to rest the, what was it? But I just don't know what else it, it could have been. Um, the tree knock back, um, like if you would say an elk would use its, if an elk took its rack and hit its rack on a tree. Uh, if they're going to rub their rack on a tree, they're going to, you know, rub it up and down in a tree. Um, they're not going to hit it like the sound of a wooden bat hitting a telephone pole. Just a real loud. You can imagine the sound if you were to go outside and do that today. That's the sound. So was that Mike's first potential Sasquatch interaction uh, that you know of? That's an interesting question because he and I have had this conversation a few times. And if he thinks back on hunting in the mountains over the years, you know, 40 years of hunting, it's a long time. And he said, there's been times uh, where uh, roads that were passable would have a log drug over them and like they would be going in somewhere and then come back out and there's a log drug over the road where they had passed. Um, the, when people talk about hearing the the screaming that you can't figure out what it is that's screaming like a woman screaming in the woods and he knows all the animal sounds so you know the cats the foxes the all these sounds he knows them all well and he had that experience uh, once but he he th he like me never thought about sasquatch ever um until I started asking him questions after I had heard about the pacing um, situations. And then I thought about my experience in the Boundary Waters up in Minnesota, northern Minnesota, years ago. I then decided to ask him if he'd ever seen anything out of the ordinary, which then started him down um, the path of listening to some podcasts and doing his own, you know, armchair research, you know, look, listening at listening to podcasts reading etc so yeah, it's, that's very very interesting have you guys ever experienced any uh you know something ken mentioned was experiencing uh finding uh grizzlies i believe out there with their necks broken uh, is that anything that you've ever run into out there 
no, um, I'm very thankful for that. Um, my, uh, you, my fear would be running into a grizzly and he's actually run into grizzlies, um, out there over the years when he's been out hunting. Um, and he's never mentioned that he's run into, into that. Um, just looking back at that and knowing that there weren't many people around, um, that entire, we were probably there for, I think, seven or eight days. We might have seen three other hunters in different places around the mountains. But, I mean, that's a, a lot of um, country to hunt. And it just doesn't make sense to us as we think back on it that it could have been a prank, you know, by another hunter. Hunters just, um, when they're too busy hunting, <laughs> to want to prank others in this way, right? Why would a hunter go to the exact same location and tree knock and huff and how would they cover that distance of walking, you know, and it just a lot of unanswered questions, but yeah, you know, that was the extent of, of the encounters. If, if you had seen one, you know, had an actual visual, uh, you were ready with, you know, both hands, uh, is that something you think about, like, what would have I done in that situation? And um, I don't know what I would have done. <laughs> I don't know what I would have done. I knew I had a uh, my hand on my gun, you know. I knew he had his gun drawn. I just didn't know. I, with, I don't know. I don't want to see one. I didn't want to see one then. I don't want to see one now. I hope I never see one. If I do, it would be in a vehicle. It would be a long distance, you know, viewing or somebody else having a really great sighting that gets recorded or something. But I don't ever want to see one. I hope I never do. Um, I, I would tend to want to retreat um, just from what I'm hearing about the size of an adult, you know, from other sightings. I, I'd want to retreat and not risk taking a shot. Yeah, that that's that's incredible it's an incredible story um since the time that you've had that happen have you heard of similar other interactions happening in the tobacco root mountains i have not and i've been searching for that i searched the podcast just to see if anybody else is talking about that location and i just haven't seen it um and i was looking because i you know you're looking for validation of what happened and um, I just haven't seen it. I'm, I'm fairly sure it wasn't a bear uh, because, and I, there are grizzlies there, because a bear doesn't have thumbs to hold a piece of wood to hit it on a tree. Um, and I think a bear um, would either come at you or go away. It wouldn't just uh, tree knock and um, respond to a tree knock and you know, I suppose bears do den or hang out in spots, but I just wouldn't think three times in a row we would have the same activity in the same place unless it was a spot, you know, because this was the only fresh elk sign we had seen really in all the time there because the elk were just in different locations than where we were, um, that it might have been if it was a Sasquatch or a grizzly, <laughs> um, it was a prime hunting spot for them where they could look down on the wallow. Is that area uh, a place that you would ever go hunting in again, or is that off uh, limits for you now because of that? That's a great question. I'm going to be going back out to Montana elk hunting with the bow again this year, and I uh, just haven't decided where we're going to go yet. Um, I don't know that I'd want to go to that specific area, that specific draw where those wallows were. Um, because that was, for me personally, um, terrifying. First to have my son there, and of course as a parent, you wanna protect your kids. Um, but then second to have somebody who knows those mountains so well um, act the way he acted, I knew that th this was something out of the ordinary. So yeah, I really don't wanna to go to that specific spot again, no. I don't blame you. I I really don't blame you. That uh, if it would feel like I've dodged, I've dodged something a few times. I don't know if I want to put myself in that situation again. I don't know if uh, what happens if lightning strikes again. You know. Right. 
Now, something interesting about this area is that um, cattle ranchers are allowed to let their cattle kind of um, free range in this area. And there were cattle at lower elevations in this area. And so you think about the beef on a cow, you know, and versus elk meat. Um, it's interesting that a cow would be very easy for a creature of this size and speed to catch, where an elk would be difficult to catch, um, or more difficult to catch. So it's just interesting. Uh, my cousin and I were talking about the fact that the cows were plentiful, you know, in that area. So that was also interesting. Oh, absolutely. It's like, make it the best food source area that you could for a large animal that needs a ton of calories per day. Let's gift wrap some huge burgers that are <laughs> walking around and have at it boys you know right that's that's phenomenal oh, man i'd love to talk to some of those ranchers I, I bet they've had some come come up missing for sure if they're free range but um leslie that has been i mean is it amazing story thank you for sharing thank you for listening to bigfoot society if you like the show please review and rate it five stars on itunes hit the share button and send this episode to all your friends on social media subscribe to bigfoot society wherever you listen to podcasts it doesn't cost a thing pick up a bigfoot society shirt or enamel pin over on our etsy page and people will tell you all about their bigfoot sightings when you wear it at least that's what people tell us that's what happens if you'd like to become an official member of bigfoot society with a membership card a community of like-minded individuals and extra content each month, then please consider becoming a supporter of the podcast by going to www.patreon.com forward slash the Bigfoot Society. Thanks for listening. Do you like aliens, UFOs, cryptids, and the supernatural? What about self-defecating humor? Uh, actually, it's self-deprecating humor. Well, you may both be right. Alien Theorist Theorizing is a comedy podcast that examines cases like Roswell, Bigfoot, Dyatlov Pass or the Atacama Alien. Was that that little pickle baby that was found at Chili's? Uh, it was alien remains found in Chile. We also explore the minds of some of the UFO community's best. We talk crop circles with Freddie Silva. And we explore the current state of UFO disclosure with my man, Richard Dolan. If any of these topics pique your interest, grab a beer and come hang out and theorize with some not-so-sober, like-minded weirdos as we wade through the BS and get inspired by the possibilities. New episodes every Friday. Subscribe to Alien Theorist Theorizing free anywhere you find podcasts or go to alientheorists.com. One night, one goal. Stop suicide. On June 3rd, Washington, D.C. will host the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention's Out of the Darkness Overnight Walk. Join thousands as we journey over 16 miles from dusk till dawn for a night of hope and healing while raising funds and awareness for this important cause. Register today at theovernight.org or call 888-THE-OVERNIGHT. That's 888-843-6837.